Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. I am so excited about this session. I am Nikki Ryberg. I'm a career coach and resume writer based in the Madison, Wisconsin area. I help people figure out what they want to do and then how to brand themselves for it, meaning like the resume, things like that, not branding like cattle. Um, and then also with mock interviews. And I'm always coming at it from an HR lens. So it's a very kind of unique part of the career coaching journey. And through this, I actually had the wonderful opportunity to meet Kim Rybeck, who is here with us today. She is a career coach, a nationally certified resume writer, and an online expert um, for profiles, LinkedIn profiles, all of that good stuff, providing career clarity, writing, and job search support to help professionals make the transition from what now to what next. Kim and I met through networking. I think she might have found me on LinkedIn and I just, we always have the best conversations. So when I had this event idea, I'm like, Kim, would you be willing to come in and talk? Because I feel like this is exactly your wheelhouse. You come at it from a lens that's so much different and stronger than what I offer. So I know my clients and myself would love to have this topic. So just to start, Kim, I know I did kind of your blurb on who you are, but let's just start there. And then I'll start digging into some questions. And I've got a few other people to let in here. And if folks have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We'll try to do that throughout if it makes sense. Otherwise, we'll definitely address them at the end. So thank you so much for being here today, Kim. Thank you, Nikki. It is so great to do this with you. I know we started talking about this a while ago, so it is fun to now have this come to fruition. I'm seeing a lot of uh, familiar names and faces as well joining us today. So um, it is great to see you all. And thank you again, Nikki, for the opportunity um, so again, my name is, is Kim, and I have had a really interesting career journey. I would say that I'm continuing to be a work in progress, as are most people. Um, careers are not linear, typically. Uh, we find that careers tend to be more of a constellation of things. And what I love to do most is help people connect the dots and uh, I call myself a bit of a theme weaver in that I help people see the themes that emerge throughout their career that they want to bring forward into the next chapters. Um, so when we talked about this topic, I hate my job, now what? Oh my gosh, I can, I can relate to this. And so many of my clients end up coming. I'm sure it's the same with you, Nikki, because you get these moments of, Oh, I just, I can't even imagine getting through another day. Um, so I'm really excited to have this conversation with you and, and dive into that further. So am I. And I wish I had had you, oh, I don't know, maybe about six years ago. <laughs> I remember voluntarily demoting myself at a job for an offering less, way less pay for way less hours thinking it's just the hours. The hours is the issue. I just need to do less. And I did that throughout an entire summer. And then I remember like the second day my youngest started kindergarten, it still wasn't better. Like I was just HR was not a good fit for me. And so I remember just hating it every day that summer. And it wasn't like anyone's particular fault. It just was not a good fit. And so my first question, Kim, is we get people coming to us all the time and they're like, I hate it. Like I cannot last one more day. What do I do? And I always like want to start lecturing them on being patient. And I'm like, this is like the what is that saying? The pot calling the kettle black or whatever. I'm the least patient person on the planet. So the fact that I'm like, got to be patient. It's like, I know it and you know it, and I'm here to remind you, but living it is different. So when clients come and they're just like, I can't handle it one more minute. Like, where do you start? Where does one start when they're that unhappy in their job? Because then it leaks over to everything. Mm, that's so true. That's so true. And I remember being in those situations too. And some days it's really hard to imagine just one more second of it. Um, so uh, first of all, it's it it's not so much about, you know, just be positive, you'll be okay. I really think it's more about uh, just be proactive. Um, 
But even before that, um, if if you're feeling that way, it's probably because it's signaling that you're at the beginning of something else. Um, it's a signal, not that that it's necessarily a wrong thing, but that there's something that you probably need to be looking into. Um, so anytime we get these nudges, even when they're super uncomfortable, I think it's something that you're probably ready to know or receive um, or take a look at um, because otherwise you wouldn't be getting those feelings at all. So the fact that you have that is a really good sign that you're ready to take something else on board. I like that. And that's so true because when I first started my business, a lot of folks with my HR background were like, can you help me with this HR project? Can you help me with this comp project? And every time I was like, Ugh, I just get this feeling in the pit of my stomach, just like I did when I was in HR versus on the career coaching side or even recruiting or retention, things just really like geared after the employee happiness. Those bring me a lot of satisfaction, but like benefits, comp, payroll, employment lawsuits, like all of that stuff. I'm like, no, thank you. And so there's so much to be said for like, when these negative feelings come up, they are indicative of like learning, well, what do you want? And so I feel like that's the next thing. Sometimes people think it's just a new job. It's just a new boss. It's just a new employer. And what do people need to keep in mind before they just jump ship? Because I was notorious for that. And I always like to remind my clients, the grass isn't necessarily greener on the other side. So what are some things we need to keep in mind? Oh, that's so true. And you hinted at some things about like you already were identifying some of the things that just weighed you down and other things that you lit that lit you up. Those are really good things to observe about yourself when you're in that situation. So, um, you know, first of all, it really is just stop, just drop in and see if you can reflect for a moment. So just take a deep breath and just start to notice what is really going on here. Um, oftentimes it is stuff that's beneath the surface, but we're really quick to point to something that's external to ourselves. Um, and we don't, that doesn't really always give us the full picture. So um, first of all, is it acute or is it chronic? So you were saying, you know, were you, maybe ending up in situations that felt very familiar somehow, a bit of a deja vu. Um, if it's something chronic, then that deserves a look as well. Like what are the things that are being repeated? What are some patterns you're noticing? What do friends and family tell you about what's going on? Sometimes having an outside objective perspective is really helpful. Um, but other times it's acute. I, I've had a lot of clients recently talking to me about sudden rapid changes in their workplace. And it can be either a change in leadership or their company was just acquired by another one and they're doing all kinds of reshuffling. And so these like intense, um, almost sudden changes can sometimes bring on or trigger something um, again, that we just need to look at. So even just asking those questions, you know, what's going on here? Is this new for me? Is this an ongoing pattern? Why do I continue to leave positions? Um, yeah, uh, looking for those patterns and trends uh, can be really helpful. And are there ways to make it better in the long term? Like, how do you not jump to another bad job for you again? Are there coping strategies you could be doing to make the current job more bearable in the meantime? I think one thing that's become really interesting to me is it's often a, a holistic approach. There's often, I'll have the same clients that tell me I never take a lunch break or burnt out. And I'm like, well, can we start with taking a lunch break? What can we do to bring some joy into your life? What are you doing on the things outside of work? But there's just so many things. Like, how do you make sure when you make a move or make a decision, it's going to be better next time? 
or how do you make it better right now if you have to stay? Because sometimes you do. Sometimes folks are like, I've got four years before retirement, a full pension. I work for the state. Let's be realistic. I'm not leaving. So what do I do? I need to make this better because I cannot handle it. Yeah, it's that's so true. Um, honestly, in my mind, um, we've talked about this before, that you basically have three choices. You can stay and pray that things get better. <laughs> but during that time, and, and honestly, it's not because you want to be miserable, right? It's, it's because sometimes that is the safer, better option, even though it's not ideal. And so in those cases, then what, there are incremental changes that you could make that could just relieve even a little bit of the pressure. So instead of throwing everything out, um, backing it up a little bit and just saying, you know, what is going right or well during my day? How can I dial that up a little bit? Um, and what's not going so well? Like, when do I find myself just procrastinating or shutting down? Are there ways that, you know, I could minimize that part of my job? Um, are there people I could connect with at work that I really align with, that I really enjoy? Could I go for a walk with them or have lunch with them? Even employing them as an accountability partner to take that lunch. Um, so sometimes if you have to stay, just making those incremental changes can make a big difference. Um, and then plotting what potentially could happen next. Um, so you can stay and pray that things get better, which sometimes does work if you can employ some proactive things. Otherwise, um, stay and play is another option. That's a midterm option where, um, you know, maybe there's things, there are things you can do to even reinvent your role a little bit, uh, find some mentors that you would like to learn from and shadow. Um, can you figure out a step at your current employer to help you grow into something more down the road? And then obviously the last option is if there's no other options to be had, then walking away is maybe the best thing you can do. Um, and then you basically just need to start formulating an escape plan <laughs> and getting clear about what you want to have different for the next time. Those were good. And I kind of want to circle back to those because I've noticed a difference in my client's appetite for what they can tolerate based on the economy. When the initial pandemic first happened and people were being laid off in large numbers and nobody knew what was happening next, what my clients were looking for was very different than what they're looking for in record unemployment. And so sometimes there's just, I wonder sometimes if society puts too much of a sort of, almost, I don't know, perception, like everyone needs to love their job and everything needs to be great. And you need to be climbing the ladder and doing all of these things. Because sometimes we then take those expectations to create unhappiness where it may not be there. So I'm curious on like the stay and pray that it gets better. Have you seen anyone do that successfully? Because I've started to see a few people do that. I have started to see a few people who started with me and said, I hate it. I can't take it another day. Get me out. And then they're like, you know, when I really took a step back and realized some of the things I'm unhappy about, there was some small changes with my schedule, small changes with what I do over my lunch break or just what I've learned to let go. I mean, that's been a big thing for me let it go. Like I can't control the other person's opinion. So I'm curious there, Kim, has that, like, what are some ways that stay and pray has worked for people? Because for some people for immediate relief, that's the only option you have, unless you can just leave. Absolutely. Yeah. I had a client um, just recently discovered that, uh, discover that it wasn't about actually hating her job. It was more about a sense of anxiety she felt in her job and being fairly new at this company and also feeling a lot of pressure to perform and 
to do a really good job without really having a lot of onboarding or orientation left her feeling pretty overwhelmed every day. And the more that we uncovered, the more we realized um, she was not reaching out and asking for help. She didn't feel comfortable doing that with her manager um, and people in leadership. Um, and, and a lot of us will struggle with that for a variety of reasons. We're trying to prove ourselves and it may be really hard to say to our manager, hey, I don't really know what's happening here. <laughs> I don't have the resources. So we found some people within her network that were in her same role um, that she could connect with and uh, use as a sounding board. And then they set up weekly meetings to touch base with each other to start relieving some of that pressure um, that she was feeling about not knowing what she was doing. And she was able to go to work every day with a much better sense of um, self-efficacy and confidence that, hey, she really does have this. So um, sometimes when we're struggling, we will tend to isolate ourselves. And the oftentimes the opposite might be more effective is to figure out who you can reach out to, you feel comfortable talking to. That's so good. I love that. I saw in a newsletter the other day that a lot of folks have a fear of failure due to fear of overwhelm. And I was like, I have that. I can very easily fall into those traps and I can see how people could. And I know when quiet quitting became all the rage, I was a huge fan of it for that reason as someone who's very overambitious, natural overachiever, perfectionist. And I can see why as an employer, no one would be super thrilled about their employee, like not giving it their all. But as someone who's always given too much and burnt out too soon, I, that can often be a coping mechanism for someone in the immediate sense of like, well, what can I let go of? What do I keep saying yes to or volunteering for or raising my hand for? So that's kind of another place that I've often started with clients is what can you let go of right away? Um, but I loved how you mentioned, like, what can you bring in? What adds you more joy? What are some things you can do within your role? I know on some of the notes you sent me, you had some really good tips for like, here's some ways to bring joy to the job. So let's talk about that, because I thought those were fascinating. Yeah, well, what what jumped out at you, Nikki? I'm so curious. I liked the one where you talked about like, so here's how I normally show up at work. Like, maybe I'm the one who never speaks up in meetings, and now I'm going to try because I'm actually finding that giving my voice brings me joy. Or maybe on the opposite hand, I'm always speaking up, always being the one to do that. So it's always falling back on my plate. Maybe I'm gonna kind of sit back for a little bit and be a little quieter. Um, I liked some of those tips because I think a lot of us, depending on what we're doing at work, I know when I would often get burnt out, getting out helped, like getting involved in my professional association, getting involved in some, community service, getting involved in like mock interviews, even like back then as an HR person, we could do those. And I loved them because it just brought me joy in a different way. Um, so I'm curious, other ways clients have kind of done that or tips or strategies you might have for them. Yeah, um, I like to call this one a uh, new hat. So if you think about, um, you know, you're going to go to work and you're going to put on something different. Uh, that day. Maybe it's a pair of glasses <laughs> or a different way of dressing uh, or doing your hair, but um, just trying something different, even if it's small. Um, I, uh, I have seen stunt doubling for a colleague that you like work really well too. So if there's someone you really enjoy being around, um, see if you could stunt double for them even in a meeting or a, a task that they don't particularly enjoy doing, but you do. I have a client who loves Excel spreadsheets, just loves them. <laughs> this would not be my thing, but um, <laughs> she started to um, organize for other people on an Excel spreadsheet, their projects, and found an enormous amount of joy in that which is ending up translating into a new role that she's carving out in project management. So she's able to um, go in and help strategize how can we get this done in a more efficient way and then employing those Excel spreadsheets. 
So, I mean, if you're, whether you're staying or you're leaving, um, see if you can score even just a quick win for your resume and build up some skills that you really enjoy that you would want to take with you next time. I really like that. And I often tell my clients that to try it out now, it's not going to become easier to do that when you're starting a new job and learning all of these new things. So learn how not to check your email on the nights and weekends now, learn how to train your staff to call or text if it's an emergency, um, learn how to practice boundaries now so that when you have a little of the imposter syndrome going on in the new job, you're well practiced on how to keep those boundaries and why. Um, is there anything else you'd want to add um, on the stay and play or walk away before we get into the P's and the people, because I really want to talk about that, because before we can talk about what may be next, I still think it's really important to kind of know what's going on for why you may be leaving, because it's usually so much more and yours were spot on, I thought. So, um, but stay in play or walk away. Anything else you'd want to add there? Yeah, I think if you're going to stay and play for a while, again, figure out some ways that um, you know, think about your legacy. So I ask clients this a lot um, when they're trying to determine whether they're going to stay or not. Just I ask them, you know, what what do you want your legacy to be? So let's just assume that you will not be here forever. <laughs> um, and that there is a point in time when you will be making a transition. How do you want that to look? What do you want to accomplish before you go? What do you want to try before you go? Um, I always suggest too that if you're not already, take advantage of employer-sponsored programs. So a lot of employers will offer coaching, wellness benefits, employment, uh, retirement plans, a lot of um, people like myself um, did not fully take advantage of vacation time. Do that. <laughs> um, and some offer professional development opportunities as well. So these are things that employers offer for a reason. So um, use them and use them to help support you and boost your your overall well-being while you're there um, and maybe at the same time establishing some good habits um, that you can take for your next role. Can I just pipe in and say and don't have any guilt there? I can't tell you how many of my clients and even back in the day employees would say, well, I feel bad doing that. I know I'm leaving anyway, so I don't want to start this thing they have to pay for this and that. The HR in me is like, if it's something like egregious, they will already have it in writing. Like you're going back for your MBA and if they don't have some sort of a, you got to stay to your clause or whatever it may be, this class, this group, this whatever. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, even conferences, I'm like, okay, you signed up for a conference and you're going, and then you got a new job three weeks later, unless they have something that like they did to protect themselves, just don't worry about it because life happens and things happen. And you still brought a lot of added bonus to that employer. That's something I hear a lot. I don't know what your thoughts are there, Kim. I'm not saying to go out and like screw your company over, but I think sometimes people overthink this because I'm like, well, they would let you go tomorrow like that if they had to. And I hate to tell you that. So any thoughts there? Because I hear that a lot and I get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do too. I get that entirely. And it's likely that your coworkers are already taking advantage of these um in, in benefits and you know they hired you based on you know the fact that they could provide these things and isn't that attractive when we're hired we're like oh my gosh we get wellness benefits we get professional development we get a retirement plan yes so yes use that that is part of the contract that you have with your employer, your relationship, um, especially retirement plans. I'm always stunned when people are not uh, leveraging those um, because that can really help you as well in making a transition during um, economical downturns. So um, yeah, I, I'm with you there. And I would also say, yes, you can feel guilty about it and do it anyway. <laughs> That's a possibility. 
<laughs> That's so true. I love that. I love that. I've just had so many folks who are like, well, I'd love to do that, but I'd feel bad. And I'm like, I don't know. You don't feel just get over it. I don't know. I don't know what else to tell you, but like go to the conference, go to the networking event. It's a heck of a lot easier to do it with a job when someone else is paying for it than my laid off clients who are like, I can't afford it. And I'm like, I would never in good conscience tell you to spend anything unless you absolutely had to your mortgage, et cetera. I get it. So do it now because otherwise it'll be too late. So Walking away. Why do people walk away? Let's talk about the P's because these are so good. And I feel like what you want to go towards, you need to know why you're walking away or what you need. Um, and they a lot get back to this. So let's let's talk there, Kim. Yeah, definitely. So I usually think of this in um, four big buckets, why people um, will typically look for a new job. And it usually has to do with the people um, meaning it could be management, leadership, misalignment, or colleagues that just, just are, there's a disconnect there. Um, the second is position. Um, maybe the role is either too challenging or challenging in a way that doesn't reflect your core strengths, your signature strengths and skills, or it's not challenging enough uh, in the way that it's motivating you and inspiring learning and growth. Um, pay is the third bucket and it is what it is. You may be getting just not enough um, financial support. Uh, and then the big one, this is the one I always talk about is sort of like the uh, iceberg under the surface that you never see, um, which is usually the thing that we're rubbing up against when we hate our jobs. Um, and this is this is vast um, and unique to each person, but um, personal has to do with things like passion, um, values, and culture um, priorities. Uh, um, many of my clients will talk about just needing more recognition or freedom or authority um, to manage their work lives the way they want to. Um, and then a big one is just not feeling valued or appreciated. Um, and I can't tell you how many people have told me that this is a big one for them, um, which again is, oh gosh. Um, we really have to dig a little bit into that one. Like, what is it about? What is valued look like? Uh, what is valued look like? What is being appreciated look like? Um, so oftentimes it's that internal stuff um, that we're not seeing on the surface that's really driving our need to just make a change. What do you see? I see a lot of that too. Um, right now, I see a lot of industry burnout, like folks who've mm. been in education a long time, like they're done with parents, they're done with administration, they're just done. Like they want a corporate job, eight to five, remote, you know, they, they just want something totally different. Um, a lot of folks are tired of people, as in the clients, the customers, all of it. Um, with this uptick in remote work, a lot of my folks are like, I don't ever want to talk to anyone again. And I just want to look <laughs> at spreadsheets all day because they're so burnt out on people. This is especially true of people in healthcare professions or those that have been very patient forward or very customer forward, where it's like all day long, they're with a variety of different personalities. But what I keep hearing over and over and over again is just that this isn't what I want. So I just want the opposite of it and I'll do anything to get it. Like, I just, I just want to work remote. I don't care what, or I know I hate what I'm doing now, but I don't know what I want. And that's the problem. If I knew what I wanted, I'd make a move. And I feel like that tends to be something I hear a lot. And I'm curious how you work with your clients on that, because how does someone figure out what they want to do, what they're interested in? They know what they don't like. They know what they are running away from. But if they're not really driving that why or like what's their passion is, I feel like sometimes the process falls flat. Um, 
So I don't know. It's tough, especially when it seems like they don't like anything. I mean, sometimes I'm like, joke, well, do you want to work? <laughs> like, <laughs> if, if you won the lottery, what would you want to do? Like, and I've had that be the case, honestly, where I've had some clients who um, they didn't really want to work. Like they went through the process with me and they're like, thank you. You helped me figure out. I really just want to stay retired or I really liked being a stay at home mom. And I really don't want to go back in the workforce. And if I rent my mom's house out, who just passed away, I can afford to do that. And I can just do some temp jobs. And there's, there's no shame in that if you can swing it financially, and there's no shame in like, hey, I'm just going to go do Instacart and Uber, and I don't want to deal with any of it. Um, But, you know, that's kind of a personal thing. But I'm curious there, what when they don't have any idea, how do you begin to get clarity towards what's next? If you're that lost in like confusion, it's so hard. It's so hard. Yeah. And I, I want to touch on what you just said that sometimes you really don't want to be doing what you were doing for 20, 30 years. Um, and I think we both find that we see clients kind of at that midlife uh, or mid career where they've been doing the same thing or in the same industry for 15 plus years and they just don't know anything else. And uh, I had a, a client just leave before she had anything else lined up, which um, is not ideal for everyone, um, but it's working out in her favor at this point. And she's going to travel for a while and do basically the complete opposite of what she's doing. I call this uncareering, where you sort of unravel yourself from a career and you go do something completely different. I did the same thing. I got so burned out. I went and worked at a thrift store because I love thrifting. Um, and it was the best experience. It was so freeing. I am I was financially supported in doing that. Um, I was making enough money and I had none of the responsibility, none of the things that I, I felt like were burning me out. And it gave me the headspace to figure out what's next. So sometimes you need to just time out, step away, clear your head so that you can start thinking more creatively. So when we're in the middle of a crisis, that's not happening. Our brains are not letting us access that creativity and possibility. So sometimes if you can swing it, taking just a bit of a time out can help. Um, And then what's next? So I like to start really broad before we narrow it down. Um, What would your ideal life look like? Um, Imagine yourself um, in your ideal life. What are you doing? How are you feeling? Um, If you made that change today, how would friends and family say you're different? What would they notice about you? Um, what would they notice about the way that you're interacting with people or engaging? Uh, what are you doing? <laughs> are you working with your hands? Are you um, out uh, doing wedding tours <laughs> with people? <laughs> like, what is that? What does that look like? And honestly, again, not based in any reality at that point, but we're just If you won the lottery, I love that question, Nikki, what would you do? I also love to ask, what did you love to do as a child? Or where do you lose track of a sense of time? Like, do you truly love to read and lose track of time? Or is it like, oh, 20 minutes go by and I'm kind of bored. Do you lose it in yoga, hiking, watching TV? I mean, that's okay. Sometimes those storylines and emotional elements. But one trend I've noticed with my clients that are extremely satisfied in their jobs is almost every single one of them will tell me, well, from the time I was a kid, I loved playing with machines. Like these are folks doing big equipment operation. I always loved the cars and the trucks and playing with the machines. Or I've got a client who's an engineer and who's like, I've always loved this. From the time I was a child, I would take apart an engine and put it back together because it was fun. Like my husband loves what he does. He's always loved that stuff. He grew up in a family where it was very commonplace. And I feel like when you grew up with a family of law, you either love it or hate it. There's usually not a lot in between (laughs) because you're either fascinated or like, oh my gosh, enough about your case. 
Um, so I am curious, like that's something I like to ask and probably would be curious if you've seen that with your clients, because oftentimes, like when I was a kid, I loved to read the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I loved salary ranges, the things that went into it, all the things. I didn't want to do any of them, but I loved knowing what all was out there. And I'm like, look what I'm doing right now. I had an, a mom friend who helps me with some interior design stuff we have going on with a kitchen remodel who's like, yeah, when I was young, my mom wanted to take me to a psychiatrist because she thought there was something wrong with me because I switched my room around so often, but I just loved it. I found it fascinating. And I'm like, look at what we're both doing right now. We're both very happy. We're both like in our lanes, um, you know, but there's other folks where they're like, this isn't at all what I like to do. My mom told me to do it. Society told me to do it. I fell into it. It's all I'm good at. It pays the bills. Now what? It's like, okay, well, I don't know. Those are some trends I see, but I'm curious there on how you start to unpack that with clients and what people should be prepared for when they start unpacking this process. Because I wish it was as simple as what did you like to do as a child, but it rarely goes that quick. <laughs> yeah. It, it provides some good clues, though. And um, again, starting broad, because sometimes the things that we love to do when we were young are not necessarily employable. <laughs> um, I love to do things like um, hike in nature and decorate and, and thrift stores. Um, but I'm not necessarily going to um, incorporate that in my life in a work way. So, but that's not to say that it isn't important food and nourishment um, to keep us energized. Um, so yeah, so sometimes, so I like to look at, first of all, it's the interests, um, industries, skills, strengths, and the values. So there are uh, lots of different ways we can do this. Some people start with their personality types if they've done things like Strength Finder or Myers Briggs. Um, it can be really eye opening, or even Ryasek, the Holland's um, inventory. If people like really enjoy getting into that, we can start there and start mining that for clues. Because sometimes what people are doing for a living might be really close to their personality type, but not, but maybe like next to it or adjacent to it. And if they just made one switch to incorporate more of the people elements or the hands-on elements, that can make all the difference. It can make it look like a brand new career. Um, so unpacking, first of all, what am I good at? And do I do that a lot or do I not do that in my job? What areas do I, am I passionate about? Is it organic food? Is it um, uh, the outdoors? Uh, is it communicating with people? Is it design? Um, so there are lots of industry options. And then like really right now, where are my values? Because those will change over time for sure. They definitely evolve. So checking in with what was and what is now is um, a big part of it. And if people are really interested in using chat GPT for this, um, that can be super, super fun is just to start typing in um, what jobs use, uh, I don't know, dance, design, and food. <laughs> And type in and just start to see what happens. So brainstorming, role storming um, is a great place to start. And then we can start getting real about it um, in terms of market and competition. I love that. I love Reddit for that too. There's entire forums on teachers that want to leave, healthcare that wants to leave. I want to earn this amount, work the least, all the things. And what I love is that people are real and they'll share it. And I've had clients roll their eyes, but I'm like, just give it a try. You may come across something you never would have thought of otherwise. And then one thing I want to add is there's what we think jobs are, and then there's what they really are. Oftentimes mm -hmm. I've seen people go through the process and they're like, okay, I met with this coach and we figured out I wanted to do X, whatever X is. 
And the practical HR in me is like job shadow, at least a couple of people. Like, let's say you're 40 and you're looking to go back to school. Please do not do it based on chat GPT or Google. Like, please go. And even your own kids. I mean, I've got my own son. I'm coming up on this with a soon to be freshman. And I've got a list of people he needs to talk to, like based on some of his interests, which are all over the place. <laughs> and I'm completely open-minded to whatever he wants to do, as long as he can pay his own way and be happy and have health insurance someday. Um, you know, it's like, you don't, you maybe college isn't for you. That's okay. Then what do these other paths look like? Let's talk to some folks in the trades, the military, but it's not just talking to them or Googling. Oh, I see plumbers make a lot of money. Like you got to really know what does a plumber do? Can I do that? Um, so I think that's a key thing too, is people can get sold on something and then they didn't really know what it was. And then they get into it and they mistrust the whole process. It took them to get there. Like, oh, I went through all of this or my guidance counselor helped me or my college helped me. And now I'm not happy. So I'm incapable of making decisions. And like, I didn't know what HR was. Like, it was really not a good fit for me. I do not like conflict or being in the middle of things. Like I like to go all in on my client or my project or whatever it is. When you're in HR, you've got an employee, you've got a manager, you've got an owner, you've got like, you are always in the middle trying to make multiple people happy. Some thrive on that and they love being able to do that and can do it well. I just found it really stressful and it burnt me out because it wasn't a good fit for me because HR wasn't what I thought it was. So mm -hmm. curious there, Kim, obviously that's where things start to get a little real, but I would want to remind people like, don't mistrust how you got to where you were, because maybe you didn't really know what it was, or maybe it's changed like healthcare, education, things have changed a lot. So are there industry disruptors where you can do it in the way that is the way you want to, or, you know, how do you use those somewhere else? So that was kind of a tangent, mm. but I am curious how that, you know, as we kind of get there and like the last question is, you know, I'm ready to leave. How do we make clients be better prepared? I feel like that leads well into that because we covered on a lot of the process, but what else can help people be prepared or what should they know or do if it's like, now what? Because going home and just Googling it is not always the best, even though that's how I fell into what I'm doing. <laughs> I was so like, oh, I like to write. Will people pay me for residence? <laughs> oh, I'm so bored at home. So I'll let yeah, this is, oh, this is super juicy. There's, oh, there's so much here. So yeah, absolutely. I think, um, so Google and chat GPT are definitely thought starters, but they're not the, the, they're not the end step. So after that, it's what resonates the most here and what could you just even dip a toe in? I, I personally am very experiential and I don't know what I don't know until I try it. And um, I remember when we first met, you gave me some incredible advice was like, you know, Kim, what's the worst thing that could happen? You might learn something. And I took that to heart and went into an experience that I had no idea about and I learned a ton. It was literally the best experience of my life, frankly, because it sent me on a whole new trajectory that wouldn't have happened had I not just taken a little bit of a risk um, and tried it. Um, so there's that. So the experience piece. But before even like committing and diving into something like I I just went for it, but not everybody <laughs> will do that. And I'm not suggesting you just leap off a cliff, right? So there's definitely, there are, you can, instead of like trying to leap, you can take bite-sized steps. And I think if, if there's any takeaway from this today, it is um, that it's, it can be very incremental steps, very small steps lead up to um, change. And that is how human beings manage change the best is by making small steps. So yeah, go talk to people in the field because HR is huge, right? That has a lot to unpack. And there are a lot of different niche areas in HR that might suit somebody better. Um, so go talk to several people about what they do and 
um, you know, do a day in the life, go watch a YouTube video <laughs> on, on what someone's doing, um, go volunteer. Um, that's a great way to do some research. If you like animals, go volunteer at the local animal shelter, hang around people who are doing something that you're interested in. Tons of free events on LinkedIn, uh, networking opportunities, professional associations. There are lots of different ways to just kind of peek back uh, through the curtain and see what's uh, going on in an industry or role. Um, and then I guess I would say too, um, consider how big of a shift you're really ready to make right now. Sometimes just having the same role in the same industry is really what you want to do, maybe just at a different company or in a different environment. That is the most, the easiest step to take, same role, same industry. If you start tweaking one or more of those things, the change is just bigger. And so you have to think about like, what am I ready to take on? at this moment? What's the next step I'm ready to take? Um, if you're changing industry and role and everything else, that's a lot. And um, just being realistic about it, that takes a lot more time and effort and energy. Um, not to say that people don't do it. I've done that. I don't know if I would recommend it because <laughs> it, it's a lot, but um, what is just one step you're ready to take right at this moment? I absolutely love that. And I feel like the jaded um, person in me would be like, must be nice to be Nikki and Kim. They had all these <laughs> wonderful opportunities and I'm miserable. I can't get through another day. And all I keep hearing is more patience, more patience. I just want to brush my resume up and anything will be better than what I'm doing. I want to caution you that friends and family are biased. They may not want you to move. They may not want you to leave that nice state gig with the great benefits. They may not want you to take the risk with the startup. And they also are not in your head. They think they know you. I think the other day, my husband accused me of being impulsive on something stupid. And I was like, I am the least impulsive person on the planet. Like if you lived in my head for an hour and saw how many ways I analyze things, like this is so offensive, but he's not in my head. None of your friends and family are. And so working with someone like Kim to really slow down and figure those things out about yourself and feel confident in where you're going next really does matter because everything comes from there. And I tell it to everyone I do an intake with, Target needs to know who to sell to. They need to know their customer. They need to know who to market to. So if you are about to go out on the job you don't know what you want. You just know you want out of where you are. Unless you have a plan in place, your resume, your cover letter, your LinkedIn, your interview answers, all the things that someone like me would help brand you on will not be as strong as they could be. And why I really loved what Kim mentioned on the incremental changes is you can work with someone like Kim to identify a very realistic incremental change to make and what a long-term strategy may be. Because maybe it's not going to work out to completely switch fields and industries and work remote and all the things all at once. It just may not. So maybe it will, and maybe you shoot for the moon, but in the meantime, figuring out what else would be better or help me get there a little closer and what does that look like is really huge because otherwise you're wasting a lot of time jumping all over the place and you don't know where you're going. Um, so I think that's where having someone who can really look for themes and patterns and politely call you out on some things because we all have bad days. And a lot of times I, at least my spouse will just be like, okay, yep, that sounds good. Like quit talking about it. And it's like a professional, you're paying to do that too. can be like, well, that's interesting. Two weeks ago, you said something very opposite of that. Let's talk there. So um, this is more of a plug for the field, Kim, as well as you, because you, you're amazing at this, but 
talk to people a little bit about that. And I think sometimes there's a perception of like, oh, must be nice. Like I don't have, you know, $10,000 laying around to do this. And I'm like, you guys, this is not as big of an investment as people think. And when you think of the trajectory of your career and the time you save and the extra money you could earn, if that's your goal, it is crazy how much it pays off. So I just kind of want to get your thoughts there, Kim, and then we'll, we'll cut it over to questions and wrap up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I love what you said about, oh my gosh, all, okay. All of those things for sure. <laughs> um, and especially around, you know, the, your friends and your family are not you. They're not you. They want you to be happy, which often means they want you to be safe. <laughs> and that is a hundred percent valid. Um, when we don't feel safe is when our brains start triggering alarms. And so of course they want you, um, to feel safe and secure and stable. Um, and that's going to look different for everybody. Honestly, I also have to just say, there is no one ideal. So um, a, a teacher of mine just said recently, um, the uh, most successful job seekers are those who compromise. So the thing is, there's no perfect job out there. It's not, um, you know, the book, do what you love and the money will follow. I love the sentiment. And yet that's not always the case. Um, and in fact, sometimes the reverse, <laughs> doing what you love is not the way to go for a career. <laughs> it takes all of the passion and fun out of it sometimes. So in talking about ideals, we're also talking about the compromises. So the things that, like you mentioned earlier, that we just set aside for a little bit. It's not to say that they're not important, but you can't have five pots on the same burner boiling all at once. That's not realistic. And oftentimes that ends up just leaving us stuck and frustrated and burned out. So removing some of those pots and shifting them to the back burner, turning the heat down on a couple of those might be the best way to go. And Having a coach in your corner who is showing up just for you and reflecting these things back to you, asking questions to help you access your own insight can be the best, best investment you ever make. Um, we bring lots of tools. Um, and so what we do is provide the framework for you to explore. You bring the wisdom the insight, your experience. I, I will, um, a lot of people on this call will have heard me say this a million times, <laughs> but I always say um, no experience is ever wasted if you can just mine it for insights, takeaways, learnings, um, it, and you have the experience and that wisdom and insight inside of you, a coach will just help you access it and then connect the dots and put it together so you can feel like, okay, I've got this. I don't have to just suck it up and try to be positive. I can take a step. I can be proactive. And I've got someone by my side who's helping me navigate that, um, what we call the messy middle. <laughs> And Kim is one of the best at this. I often refer clients to her. She's fantastic. So I do want to open it up to any questions before we wrap up. So if people want to use the chat, if they don't want to be shown on the recording, that would be fine. Or maybe people don't have questions, but I at least want to give that chance. But um, while we wait for people to type anything in. Kim, how do people reach you? Because of course she is so good at this. I'm like, she's already booking up crazy fast, <laughs> which doesn't surprise me at all. Um, and, but seriously, how do people find you and tell us a little bit more about what programmings and offerings you have, because you have some cool stuff in the works. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to be rebranding soon. So take, <laughs> stay tuned for that. But, um, but the best way to find me is on LinkedIn. Um, it's Kim Dash Ribich um, on LinkedIn. And I always love to just have a conversation. So um, wherever you're at, if you're just feeling stuck and just need some um, fresh insight or feedback, 
um, just don't hesitate to reach out, message me on LinkedIn. I will always respond and, um, and then we can just set up a call and just talk through what you're looking for. I will um, typically do a hybrid coaching slash resume writing model. So that might be a little different than what people are used to. I don't do just straight resume writing. I like to coach alongside my client and help them rediscover themselves through their resume. So we use it as a coaching tool while we're refreshing it. Um, but we, I use it to pull out themes um, to help them move forward. So uh, a lot of career clarity coaching, transition coaching, resume, LinkedIn, all of those things. That's awesome. We didn't really have any questions. We just had someone add that they love their job. Yay. They like the session and the suggestions that you had. I really appreciate them too. I'm trying to think of anything else on my notes. I just, I think you did a really good job of like really calmly explaining this as a process and that incremental can be such a huge part of it. I think there's too many snake oil salesmen out there who will pretend just take this survey or just do this course or pay $5,000 to work with me and you're going to figure everything out. And I'm always apprehensive of that because it just, I don't think life works that way. And I love how you got into so many parameters and how important it is to kind of sit back. So I do appreciate that. Um, oh, we got a couple ones. So somebody said, any recommendations if you are interested in changing industries with the next move? I think you touched on this a bit, but I'll let you cover that one, Kim. Uh, if you're changing industries, but potentially not roles. Um, no, yep. Yeah. Okay. So if it's a different industry, um, do some research ahead of time about um, what are the specific skill sets within an industry. Um, again, really depending on which one you're wanting to switch to, um, you may need um, a PMP, for example, mm -hmm. or um, some kind of um, additional specific qualification or skill. And a lot of times we can get this through LinkedIn courses or certifications, um, but find out what the lingo is. So the language is important. Are they using different terminology? Are they, um, are they really niche? And then it's building on who do you know who knows someone there? Or um, again, a professional associations, I think are, I've used that myself and I've just joined a professional association or gone to some conferences um, or some meetups um, to just learn more about the industry and start hanging around um, where they are. And I have to say, be aspirational. So if you're going to switch an industry, start pretending like you're already there. I love that. I would say the same thing. Let's say someone wanted to get into HR and they were a social worker. I've actually had a lot of these clients and they just ran into one a couple of weeks ago and they got a job. They were able to get a different role with HR-ish duties in their same department. So oftentimes switching, if you want to switch industries, you might want to just try to be, let's say, a social worker in an entirely different industry, get out of senior living, get into the hospital, go through more continuing ed, and then look for a non-social worker position in the hospital. Or, you know, if you're in HR, it's far easier to switch industries than it would be to switch HR. Um, if you're still finding that to be a hurdle, exactly all the advice Kim said get around the people doing it to find out what do they need? What do they keep missing out on in their new hires? Where are the labor market needs? Where are some additional certifications, trainings, networking you could be doing to stand out? Because I always look on it, what's your competition? If they all are thriving in that industry and field and there's a plethora of people, we've got to figure out how to make you stand out. And that needs to be based on what that employer needs. So um, that's probably like a whole part of a unpacking in terms of like, how do we brand you and make you stand out? So you need to know the goal and then you need to know what are their needs to stand out on that. But excellent question. Um, yeah, okay. A few folks asked for some ways to reach out, not on LinkedIn. Kim did provide her email there. So you can certainly reach out to her that way. Um, I hope everyone 
follows her on LinkedIn and reaches out. Does anyone else have any other questions or things that they feel like we didn't cover or resources or tools they're looking for to help them in the meantime if they're really unhappy? My contact info, I'm going to type that into, is on LinkedIn. Love LinkedIn. If you're not on it, I do recommend it. I don't like social either, but I am on LinkedIn. Such a good one. Um, what else, Kim? I just so appreciate your time today. My favorite part of my job is meeting people like you. I just, from the Likewise. time we met, I was like, oh, and I think we're both from Wisconsin, but Kim's out in Colorado. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, one of these days I'll get out there and we'll meet for real life in coffee person. It'd be lovely. <laughs> You're my connection back to my home state too. So whenever I get back there, um, I'm coming to visit. Um, yeah, I feel the same way, Nikki. Thank you so, so much. Um, yes. I hope we get a chance to do this again. I always yes. learn something from you. So um, this was inspiring. Thank you for so the opportunity. Thank you. And I will be putting this on YouTube, sending out a link to everyone. It will be tomorrow. So if anyone's reaching out or Kim, you get folks that are like, oh, can I get a copy? Just it's coming tomorrow. Don't worry. Um, so appreciate everyone spending their time with us today too. And please do not stay miserable in a job you don't like. There are ways to get out of it. No excuses. Just talk to, talk to someone like Kim and just get started. Um, I promise you it's worth it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.